Hello everyone, about a month ago I switched my phone from the Honor Magic 6 Pro, which I was quite satisfied with, to the Xiaomi 14 Ultra. In this video, I'll share my experience using it over this period. I'll also compare it with the Magic 6 Pro in certain aspects. The appearance should be familiar to most. It has a 6.73 inch equal width, micro curved screen with narrow bezels, and a matte metal frame with right angles extending from the sides to the back, a larger and thicker camera module than the 13 Ultra, and the Parisian decorative stud texture on the back cover, which has eliminated the so-called camera streamline step. The material looks like glass and feels like ceramic. I can totally accept paying $64.99 for a glass back cover, but I can't agree if it's insisted to be ceramic. In terms of appearance, I prefer the 13 Ultra, which is absolutely aimed at the camera. Its design feels stronger, and the short film display is full of style. The 14 Ultra, although it looks more like a phone now, doesn't feel much better even without a case. The middle frame and the huge camera module are too big, it's easy to dirty your fingers, and the sense of layers is not as rich as the previous generation which is a sort of progress. It comes with a plastic hard case with the bottom and buttons exposed, making replacement convenient. Moreover, the back is matte, which is not prone to grease fingerprints, making it superior to the 14 Pros and much more upscale than the Magic 6 Pros clear soft shell. The camera module area even has a textured scale pattern that feels bumpy and quite stress relieving to snap on. The weight of the bare phone is 227 grams, and with the case, it's 247 grams. Although it's only a difference of half a pound, I still dare not go bareback with a phone that costs 6 or 7,000 yuan, especially since my Magic 6 Pro got dented from going naked. If they provided a better case, this wouldn't have happened. The Xiaomi 14 Ultra as the first surging Ultra felt a bit off in the stomach when I first got it. Where was it off? Oh, the smoothness. It's definitely the smoothest Xiaomi phone I've used since 2021. The day I switched from Honor, I didn't even feel a drop in performance. Many people probably know that the Magic UI is the kind of system you can criticize for its animation or lack of functions, but if you say it's not smooth, you're definitely going to get blasted, and those frequently appearing animations in the 8.0 version have already caught up. As for the Surge OS, although there has been a fair amount of interface design change, the animations haven't made much progress. Inform the control center that the switch animation is still stiff, the use of mini window dragging and resizing is hugely delayed, and the playback of split screen videos is shockingly impactful from various aspects. A hundred years of astonishment at the three dots at the top of the window, to this day, they are among the most tumultuous failures on the OS in my heart, and this smoothness after using it for a while is back to taste again. It's not about obvious frequent frame drops or stuttering, but during browsing through auto-playing news streams and quickly toggling between apps, there's an occasional feeling of a hitch or a slow response. Not frequent, more an unnoticeable kind unless one is deliberately looking for it. But ironically, having switched from the magical S system, where 99% or even 99.9% .9 of the time it was very smooth, my perception is relatively stark. Nevertheless, I would still give a positive assessment on the smoothness of the Surge OS on the 14 Ultra. For one, the improvement is significant, and second, it's not far behind the Huawei Yao V. But this evaluation is limited to the 14 Ultra or Xiaomi flagships, as the smoothness of the Redmi Note 13 Pro, at the same price point of over a thousand, is unrecognizable when beaten by the Honor X50 and IQ Zoot 8, precisely because I said in that video of Redmi's that one could get used to its smoothness. I was ridiculed by colleagues for half a year, labeled as an adaptive user, but back to the progress in smoothness. The full equal voice, slightly curved screen also plays a role. Because of it, the full screen gestures are very smooth, physically buffed, a rare silkiness that's both internally and externally polished on Xiaomi phones. And at the same time, the screen's frontal view is more harmonious than its predecessor, with a higher screen to body ratio. However, for me, two issues with the 14 Ultra's subtle curved screen effect use. First, the high curvature is not enough near the glass edges, and second, the display stretches over the curve, resulting in color shifts. In normal holding of the phone or when laying flat on a desk when the screen tilts forward relative to the line of sight, the top curved part darkens and turns green, which is noticeable with lighter colors. Then when the light is complex, the reflection on the curved surface reduces the immersion in content and affects the user's focus. Of course, the current phones that also use the full cozy, subtly curved screens can't completely avoid this problem. The Huawei Mate 60 Pro and Nova 12 Ultra, because of their smaller curvature and wider black edges. Glare and color bias are relatively minor. Personally, I find noticeable screen glare to have a larger impact on me, and a deficiency in display quality exacerbates this issue. The brightness is set to professional true color mode with a full white background. Manually, it's the traditional 500 nits and automatically only 1050 nits, even though it can't match other flagships boasting 1200, 1500 or even 1800 nits in specifications, the real world experience also falls short. The screen brightness is insufficient, making it quite strenuous to see the content clearly. I didn't have this issue with the Magic 6 Pro. Taking into account the seasonal and weather changes, I briefly compared the automatic brightness of both phones. In the bright outdoor light of late March in Changsha, at 3 in the afternoon, the sun is quite fierce. The 14 Ultra maxed out at its limit of 1050 nits, but compared to Magic 6 Pro's 1450 nits, the hardware disadvantage was clear. Then on the backlit balcony, the 14 Ultra's 380 nits fell short of Magic 6 Pro's 420 nits, showcasing the difference in brightness adjustment strategies. 
Within the hardware's capability, at least for me, Xiaomi's brightness adjustment is too conservative. I guess one reason for the conservative brightness strategy is to control the heating. This phone heats up really fast and it feels quite warm after playing Genshin for just 5 minutes due to the good heat conduction. Speaking of gaming experience, I'd rather play Genshin on Magic 6 Pro even if it gets hot. Actually, I usually play on the X100, which is truly powerful. I need to clarify that our Genshin test model leans towards prolonged extreme performance release. The load is indeed very heavy, and the Magic 6 Pro has to lock to 40 frames for 2.5 minutes already. So, any device that scores well on our model deserves praise. When playing less demanding games, Honor does not lock frames and provides a better experience than Xiaomi, mainly due to better control of frame drops in frequency and magnitude. As for temperature, they're both quite high, as I play with a case on. The shell provides a fuller and more comfortable grip. The large camera bump isn't too uncomfortable to hold. Considering the 14 Ultra's price tag of over 6,000, I feel its gaming performance needs improvement. After looking at the performance details, the 14 Ultra has five large boxes, with two running at 1 GHz and three at 2.5 GHz, a stark contrast in performance. In comparison, the IQ12 with five large cores has a similar frequency, working more cohesively, resulting in slightly higher power consumption and lower temperatures, but the frame rate is 59.5 FPS for IQ12 versus 54.5 FPS for the 14 Ultra, with more severe fluctuations. To address this, I had no choice but to sacrifice image quality for smoothness. After reducing the Xiaomi 14 Ultra's graphics from extreme to high, the power consumption decreased by 0.4 watts, and the smoothness performance was identical with the same CPU core scheduling strategy. Alright, I get your point. It's like putting all your eggs in one basket and giving up on the gaming experience. Some might say, isn't it unfair to compare an imaging flagship to a performance phone in gaming? Indeed, even though I haven't said much positive except for system fluidity improvements, the experience isn't even better than the Magic 6 Pro, so why am I tempted to switch back? Using a colleague's words, the software department and camera team of this phone seem like they're from completely different companies. I completely agree. Cameras that truly impress are rare, and although I don't go out of my way to take photos, I love pulling out my phone and snapping a few when I see a nice view or something interesting. I've come to terms with my mediocrity in photography after switching through many phones. If I were to summarize it in one word, it's about practice. After using the 14 Ultra's camera for a while, I could describe the experience as very intuitive. It's mostly given me positive feedback, making me feel not so inadequate anymore. When the weather is fine, I'll also go out to take photos. The shooting process is very smooth, the shutter latency is very low, and for the majority of scenes it's click and done. You can go straight to the gallery without waiting for any onerous image processing. There's hardly any discrepancy between the camera preview and the final image, so I'm quite confident about whether the shot will turn out as I want. Moreover, the shoot is highly controllable. Use any lens you prefer. Dislike macro switching to ultra wide? Turn off the two telephotos that also support macro. No need to worry about face tracking for framing, it's more freeing. Poor lighting? Switch the main camera to crop mode, turn off the two telephotos for a larger aperture. Isn't that for low light photography? Auto night mode and permanent HDR shutdown. The button's right on the camera interface, convenient for toggling and status checking. Moreover, the 14 Ultra's camera interface has seen changes from its predecessor. The capture mode switch moved from settings to the top of the interface, with an added exposure adjustment button at the bottom. The operation and adjustment are much more user-friendly. Overall, I'd score the 14 Ultra's shooting experience a 90. Taking photos is truly enjoyable. I find myself stopping to take pictures more often, even snapping odd things just for fun. It's not about stunning results, but rather the joy and emotional value. The only annoyance is the brightness dropping when the screen faces away from light, making it hard to see in strong sunlight. But it's not about hurriedly hitting the shutter and ending up with garbage photos. At least to my aesthetic, I really like them. As for scoring, I'd also give it a 90. Firstly, for the colors, I stick with Leica Vibrant and never change the 14 Ultra settings. Not seeking absolute realism, it adjusts certain scenes or colors specifically. The reds often appear brighter and more saturated, even slightly orange tinted, than in reality. Green plants, when the frame is full and with good lighting, look tender and lively, brimming with vitality. I also noticed that the 14 Ultra loves blue skies. If the sky's blue, it captures it bluer than it actually is. The longer the focal length, the more pronounced this becomes. There's blue sky enhancement, super blue sky enhancement, and ultra powerful juice enhancement. When it comes to the colorful lights at night, reds and blues go full saturation creating a very cyberpunk feeling. Unreal but atmospheric, which I quite enjoy. Regarding the rendition of light and shadow, bright is bright, and dark is dark. Though overall brightness does adapt to the surrounding environment. Though the depth is unmistakably present, imparting the image with a pronounced sense of dimensionality, the origin of the light is readily apparent. 
Reflecting on these evening cloud snapshots, I'm struck by how apt the Give Light and Shadow More Depth slogan of the 14 Ultra is. Nonetheless, the Auto HDR seems somewhat understated, resulting in black undetectable patches in high contrast areas, which is disheartening since, although not a fan of heavy-handed HDR, I expect the photos to reflect my visual experience closely. Style preferences in photography certainly add complexity. The matter gets quite intricate. For example, some pictures might appear overly dim with harsh contrast to me, but a colleague could find the dimmed lights in night scenes to be perfect, ensuring proper brightness, untainted whites, vibrant reds, reduced flares and ghosting, which are reasonable, with point light sources typically producing a discrete blotch. I'll now discuss my preferred telephoto lenses, the 3.2x and 5x zooms, which are used for nearly all my gallery images. They excel in composing shots of flora and inanimate subjects, thanks to their minimum focus distances of 10 and 30 centimeters, respectively. With apertures of f1.8 and f2.5, the depth of field effect is enhanced, emphasizing the subject with ease. These effects stem from simple physical principles without complex technical requirements, making it easy to capture stunning photos and kindling the urge to photograph. They're especially convenient for snapping quick pics of pets. And for someone like me who prefers distance, taking shots from afar with a tenfold zoom proves quite effective. But the 3.2x zoom lens at f1.8 isn't ideal for macro shots. The largeness leads to edge blur. Even though this lens offers depth of field blending, the performance isn't consistently reliable. Initially, areas that were clear may become less so after blending. Then what becomes sharp as a result doesn't always center on the intended subject, creating much unpredictability. Additionally, a steady hand is essential. Hold still after the shutter clicks to avoid errors in synthesis. The five-fold zoom lens has a few quirks. I faced composition issues on two occasions, each distinct and spaced over a fortnight. Plus, there was once a prolonged flicker in the camera interface. And finally, considering the functionality of the two telephoto lenses. When you use the sky as a backdrop for photography, edge haloing and scaling artifacts can often be seen, which become more pronounced at higher zoom levels. By the time this video is viewed, I trust Xiaomi will have remedied the problems I've pointed out. That would be the perfect scenario. Resolution is actually a minor worry for me. I highlight it because, beyond reading reviews, I hardly ever magnify images on my phone. But even so, the perceived quality of some shots is poor, due to the 14 Ultra's tendency to exaggerate contrast in light and shadow. Then, in dim lighting, the software sometimes intervenes too aggressively, in shooting dense textures from afar, like floor tiles or leaves, the result is very unpleasant. Additionally, some lines become quite distorted after processing, giving off a distinctly Lovecraftian vibe. The 14 Ultra also performs poorly in rendering reflections on the ground. At that point, I would prefer it to be blurred. Since the resolution was already subpar, and I don't like zooming in to pixel peep, I don't care about noise in the shadows when enlarged. I'm satisfied as long as I can take decent looking pictures with the telephoto lens. However, I still hope the next generation will replace the 3 858, and with an improved aperture, the clarity should also get better. Lastly, a quick word on video recording. With 4K at 60fps, the stabilization feels unsteady, lens transitions are sluggish, and the hue from the 3.2x telephoto lens is quite different compared to other lenses. The image handover between the 3.2x and 5x optics is just adequate. To sum it up, it doesn't match the iPhone 15 Pro Max I had. So, ultimately, the sheer resolution matters less than the enjoyment and contentment with the visual outcome. Speaking of battery, the 5300mAh doesn't translate to exceptional longevity. It lasted under 7 hours in our rigorous testing, a typical result for Xiaomi in the context of mobile era battery endurance. The tuning may not be quite right, as playing games with high workloads and taking photos drains the battery quickly. On work days, charging as needed is fine, but on days off, I hesitate to go out if below 50%. Rather than taking fewer photos, I would prefer to recharge before going out again. The wired charging at 90 watts takes about 15 minutes to reach half, and it shows 100% in 41 minutes which is adequate. I seldom use the 80 watt wireless charging. As camera modules get larger, old wireless chargers become less compatible, and our studio's 80 watt charger can only reach 50%. I'm done with expenditures. As a my enthusiast who transitioned from MIUI i12 to MIUI i14 before moving to Origin OS, I wish Xiaomi's system would focus more on core functionalities, issuing superfluous features. Take the Surge S processor for instance. The status bar's notification icon tally was reduced from 3 to 1, yet the Mi 14 Ultra allows reverting to the 3 icon display. Then they unveiled a semi-permanent Bluetooth toggle with MIUI i14, similar to iOS, only to introduce a timer to switch it off in Surge again and they changed the countdown timer in MIUI i14 to an exact end time, reverting back to showing remaining minutes. It all seems like unnecessary tinkering. With so many users, don't they understand to plan before acting? A good feature is modified, then it's reverted back after complaints. Just be like some big brands, unyielding, not swayed by users. Whenever this occurs, it seriously tests my patience and outlook. Having moved from a devoted fan to just a regular user, I'd rather not become utterly disenchanted.
It would be wonderful if Xiaomi's development team recognized that the Xiaomi 14 Ultra possesses extended merits and not quite so fleeting flaws. Admittedly, the screen brightness, comfort, battery endurance and gaming performance could use enhancement, yet the photographic capabilities are impressive, with a distinctive approach to imagery that captivates. For example, the Mi 13 Ultra featured a larger lens aperture, along with macro zoom capabilities and smoother operation, but I'm bothered by the extra $500 for satellite communication, a feature I don't use with my telecom card. That's the gist for this overview. For further enticing updates, keep watching and kindly refrain from labeling me a critic until the next session.